Everybody. Uh, my name is Maggie Nelson. I'm the director of the CalArts Creative Writing Program. And on behalf of our writing program, we welcome everybody. We're so glad to see you. And um, I'm going to turn the uh, bulk of the introducing over to Brian Evanson, um, an acclaimed fiction writer who joined us on our MFA this spring. Uh, but first, a few shout outs. Um, I want to extend a profound thank you and a special welcome to Leslie Jacobson and Janine Caltagirone parents of our alum, Katie Jacobson, as they make possible the Katie Jacobson Writer in Residence program, which is hosting George Saunders' visit this week, and which has brought, brought us uh, truly terrific writers for the past three years. So we're deeply grateful, and thank you. Um, on that note, I'm also pleased to announce that next year's Katie Jacobson Writer has been confirmed as Juno Diaz, and so the exciting times will keep coming, and we'll see you here in 2017 for that. Um, also, I want to thank uh, previous MFA director Janet Sarbanes, who laid the groundwork for this event, uh, Seth Blake, Alicia Manzano, Brian Evanson, Giovanni Alonzi, Quinn Gansedo, Aaron Campbell, Sarah Nelson, and President Stephen Levine, who's here tonight, um, all of whom have provided assistance along the way. Um, thanks also especially to our students and faculty uh, of the writing program, uh, many of whom have participated in George's events on campus this week, the residency. Uh, has this public event component, but it also has a more intimate uh, pedagogical component where um, George has been able to spend some time with our students, uh, for which I think we're all uh, better, uh, better writers and grateful people. I um, also want to thank Skylight Books. As you might have noticed, Skylight is selling uh, many of George's titles in the lobby, and so we're going to do the reading. Well, Brian will introduce George. Uh, we'll do the reading. Uh, George will take a few questions, and then after that, Skylight will be selling uh, books during the reception, so stick around for everything. And the last thing I want to say is just that uh, as we choose a Katie Jacobson writer in residence each year, we are always looking for writers uh, whom we think reflect the spirit of our program, which is innovative, uh, genre-crossing, critically-minded, and daring, uh, and rigorous. At the same time, we want to bring writers whose writing speaks to many people, many different people who will come out and fill up our house. And very clearly, George Saunders is such a writer, and so we're thrilled to have him here tonight. Um, please welcome Brian Evanson, who will introduce George, and, uh, and we're in for a good time. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here at Red Cat tonight to introduce George Saunders, who I think of as one of the most uh, audacious and finest writers of short fiction working in the form today. I first became aware of George Saunders' work almost two decades ago when I was teaching at Oklahoma State University and decided on a whim to teach a story collection that I've been hearing good things about just so that I could find time to read it. That book was George's first collection, Civil War Land and Bad Decline, and it was unlike anything being written at the time though I also see it as the start of writers beginning to seriously question the previously accepted dividing line between realism and fantastic fiction. Indeed, it's a book that has become a touchstone for blurred genre writers who came after him. It was a book full of amusement parks gone wrong in which realism was punctured and fractured by strange and fantastic moments that would suddenly bloom up in a way that seemed at once startling and utterly justified. It presented a strange, somewhat dystopic future that closely re resembled our own dystopic present, where you were once felt the solidity of the fictional world and saw how that world had connections to our own. It was innovative in terms of its content, but it coupled this innovation with a careful attention to language that made every word feel necessary, and a solid understanding and appreciation of characters as well. You could feel that Sam Sanders saw his characters less as pieces to be moved around on fiction's game board, and more as avatars of human experience that deserve to be treated with both respectful tenderness and brutal honesty. <coughs> For me, this is something that characterizes George's work as a whole. He has a tremendous sense of empathy, but also a refusal to give any of his characters alibis. He wants to understand them, not make excuses for them. He shows a willingness, even while letting his characters engage in antics, to confront the naked reality of who they are and to acknowledge our kinship with them. This is true as well of his second collection of stories, Pastoralia, 
of the prehistoric reenactor in the title story, or of the harried male stripper slash waiter who works at a family restaurant called Joysticks in the Sea Oak. These damaged men are not figures of fun, or rather they are no more figures of fun than we are ourselves, subject to the same humiliations and joys that we feel. Add to that Sanders', Sanders ability in stories such as John found in, 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 in Persuasion Nation, or the Semplica Girls in his latest collection, 10th of December, to incorporate the absurd, the strange, and the culturally unexamined in a way that seems normal and natural. And it becomes clear why his work is so respected and considered so original. It is at once jubil jubilantly strange, grotesquely funny, and deeply human. That's a combination that almost no other writer I know can manage. And nobody in any case is as good at it as Sanders is. Please join me in welcoming George Sanders. I also wanted to shout out to the students. I had I taught a three-hour class today and one yesterday, and it was just like fun. They were the kids were so uh, responsive and, and bright, and it was a really pleasure. So thanks to them. Um, also the Jackson family. I'm so grateful to be here, and thank you for your generosity and your vision and memory of Katie. And, and all. Uh, so I've been working in this mode that I think of as third-person ventriloquist, which is kind of like, it's, it's basically third person, but you kind of get into the person's head a little quicker. And the, the goal is to kind of eliminate that sort of snooty third person know-it-all uh, and just get right into the person's head and start kind of using her diction and uh, thinking in her skewed mode as quickly as you can. So this story is um, a pretty new one, and really, it's, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. It's just two old ladies meet on the street, basically. It's like a, like a joke. Um, but so part of this this shtick is that there's a lot of internal voices, which I think is we all had that. I hope we do because I sure do. Uh, these little internal voices coming out of nowhere to chasten us and nag us and so on. So I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I've never read this one publicly before. I've been looking forward to this event for a long time, so I thought I'd try something a little risky. So I think it, it times out about seven hours. So. <laughs> Okay, so thanks again. Uh, this is a story called Mother's Day. The trees along Pine Street that every spring bloomed purple flowers had bloomed purple flowers. So what? <laughs> Always a big deal. It happened every spring. Pammy kept saying, look at the flowers, Ma. Ain't them flowers amazing? The kids were trying to kiss up. Polly had flown in. Pammy had taken her to the Mother's Day lunch and now was holding her hand. Holding her hand right on Pine Street. The girl who once slapped her own mother for attempting to adjust her collar. <laughs> Pammy said, Ma, ah, these flowers, wow, they really blow me away. Just like Pammy to take her mother to lunch in a sweatshirt with a crossed out picture of a machine gun on it. What about a nice dress or pantsuit? At least this time, Pammy and Polly hadn't been on her about the smoking. Even back when Pammy was taking harp, even back when Polly's hair was long and he was dating that Eileen, even after Eileen slept around and Polly shaved his head, whenever Polly and Pammy came over, they were always on her about the smoking, which was rude. They had no right. When their father was alive, they wouldn't have dared. When Pammy slapped her hand for adjusting her collar, Paul Sr. had given her such a wallop. The town looked nice. The flags were flying. Ma, did you like your lunch? Pammy said. I like it fine, Alma said. At least she didn't have an old lady voice. She just had her same voice, like when she was young and nobody looked better in a tight dress going for cocktails. <laughs> Ma, I know what, Pammy said. How about we walk up Pickle Street? What was Pammy trying to do, cripple her? They'd been out for two hours already. Polly had slept late and missed lunch. He'd just flown in and boy were his arms tired. <laughs> Paul Sr. had always said that after a trip. Polly had not said that. <laughs> Polly not having his father's wit. <laughs> Plus it looked like rain. Black, black blue clouds were hanging over the canal bridge. We're going home, she said. You can drive me out to the grave. Ma, Pammy said, we're not going to the grave, remember? We are, she said. <laughs> At the grave, she'd say, Paul, dear, everything came out all right. Polly flew in and Pammy held my hand after once they laid off the smoking crap. They were passing the Manfrey place. Once in the Nixon years, 
Lightning had hit the Manfred cupola. In the morning, a portion of cupola lay on the lawn. She'd walk by with Nipper. Paul Sr. did not walk Nipper. Walking Nipper being too early. Paul Sr. had been a bit of a drinker. Paul Sr. drank a bit with great sophistication. <laughs> At that time, Paul Sr. was selling a small device used to stimulate tree growth. <laughs> you attached it to a tree and supposedly the tree flourished. When Paul Sr. drank a bit with great sophistication, he made up lovely words and sometimes bowed. This distinguished looking gentleman would appear at your door somewhat sloshed and ask, were your trees slaggered? <laughs> were they gulp lagging behind the other trees? Did they need to be perorated? And he'd hold up the little device. In this way, they had nearly lost the house. <laughs> Paul Sr. was charming, but off-putting. <coughs> in the sales sense. The efficacy of his tree simulators was nebulous. Paul Sr. had said so in his low drunk voice on the night that it appeared most certain they would lose the house. Mother, he said, the efficacy of my tree simulators is nebulous. <laughs> Ma, Pammy said. What? Elmo snapped. What do you want? He has stopped, Pammy said. Don't you think I know it? She said, my knees hurt. Daughter dragging me all over town. She had not known it. She knew it now, however. They were opposite the shop where the men used to cut pipe. Now it was a lean-in fit. The time they nearly lost the house, Polly had come to their bed with a couple of pennies. He was bald these days and sold ad space in the penny saver. Pammy worked at No Animals Need Die. That was the actual name. The place smelled like hemp. On the shirts and hats for sale were cartoons of cows and saying things like, Thanks for not slamming a bolt through my head. <laughs> and as children, they'd been so bright. <laughs> she remembered Polly's Achievement Award. One boy had wept when he didn't get one, but Polly got one. Yet they turned out badly. <laughs> Worked dumb jobs and had never married and were always talking about their feelings. <laughs> Something had spoiled Polly and Pammy. Well, it wasn't her. She had always been firm. Once, she left them at the zoo for disobeying. When she told them to stop feeding the giraffe, they continued. She left them at the zoo and gone for a cocktail. <laughs> and when she returned, Pammy and Polly were standing repentant at the front gate. Zoo balloons deflated. That had been a good lesson in obedience. A month later, at Ed Pedlowski's funeral, and with a single harsh look, she'd ordered them to march past the open coffin. They'd march past the open coffin, lickety-split, no shenanigans. <laughs> Poor Ed had looked terrible, having been, having been found after several days on his kitchen floor. <laughs> Ma, you okay? Pammy said. Don't be ridiculous, Alma said. In the early days, she and Paul Sr. had done it every which way. Afterward, they'd lie on the floor discussing which colors to paint the walls. But then the children came, and they were bad. They cried and complained. They pooped at idiotic random times. They stepped on broken glass. They'd wake from their naps and pull down the window shades as she lay on the floor with Paul Sr., not yet having done it any which way. And she'd have to rise exasperated, which would spoil everything. And when she came back, Paul Sr. would be out in the distant part of the yard having a minuscule purse novel. <laughs> Soon Paul Sr. was staying out all night. Who could blame him? Home was no fun due to Pammy and Polly. Drastic measures were required. She bought the wildest under things. Started smoking again. Once, she let Paul Sr. spank her bare bottom as she stood in just heels at the refrigerator. Once in the yard, she crouched down, schnuckered, waiting to leap out at Paul Sr., and leaping out, found him pantsless. <coughs> that was part of it. The craziness. Part of their grand love. Like when she'd find Paul Sr. passed out on the porch and have to help him to bed. That was also part of their grand love. <laughs> Even that time, he very funnily called her Millie. <laughs> One night, she and Paul Sr. stood outside at a window, drinks in hand, watching Polly and Pammy wander from room to room, frantically trying to find them. That, that, had, that had been in fun. That had been funny. 
When they finally went back in, the kids were so relieved, Pammy burst into tears, and Polly began pounding Paul Sr. so fiercely in the groin with his tiny fist that he had to be sent to... Well, he certainly had not been sent to sleep in the garden shed in the dark of night, <laughs> as he always claimed. They would not have done that. They had... Probably they'd laugh it off in their free-spirited way. <laughs> then send him to bed for hitting. After which, probably he'd run out and hidden in that shed rebelliously. They'd searched and searched. Searching and searching heroically, they finally found him in the shed. <laughs> Sleeping naughtily across a fertilizer bag. Tears streaking the dirt on his... Why had he been crying when he was supposedly hiding rebelliously? It was all a long time ago. She wasn't getting in the frickin' time machine about it. <laughs> the sky was black now over the library. If Pammy got her caught out in the rain, she would ask to God tear Pammy a new one. One Fourth of July, Paul Sr. had groped her in the mums. He liked that. He'd been craving more wildness. Okay, pal, here it is. That did the trick. Around the time of the groping in the mums, one ceased hearing the name Millie. Ditto Carol Menninger. Ditto Evelyn, whoever. <laughs> One briefly ceased hearing those names and smelling those strange perfumes during that fleeting, victorious period of victory by wildness. Where had the kids been that magical Fourth of July? Somewhere happy with sparklers, probably. Two sparklers had approached, then paused, then departed pronto. <laughs> well, that would teach them to spy. That would teach them that adults needed their private time. Behold, kitties, Paul Sr. had slurred drunkenly into her bare back. Welcome to your painful Eiffel. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon after that wild fourth came another near loss of house. <coughs> All wildness ceased. In the absence of wildness, the names and perfumes resumed. No, a person misremembered. The aide worked shoulder to shoulder to save the house. And the entire question of names, perfumes, had permanently receded, both of them finding it humorous that anyone could possibly think that Paul Sr. would ever consider. She was so tired. Stupid Pammy. Inconsiderate Pammy. Home, she said. Up ahead, across pines, sweeping her walk was. Was that? It was Debbie Hather. Good God, was she old. <laughs> the strange, trashy girl in high school. Big hippie, tiny head, <laughs> curly hair, no chest. Look her over there, still weird. <laughs> Asian blouse, pants with ties at the ankles, bird skinny. Who did she think she was, Gandhi? Or whoever misses Gandhi? <laughs> hippie Grammy? <laughs> Sweeping like a banshee in front of that same tiny former carriage house she'd lived in since she was a girl with her oddball parents, Mandy and Randy. <laughs> Both had limps. <laughs> different limps. When they walked down the street, it was like a freaking dance party. <laughs> no, hang on a brief and short second there, Eisenstein, Paul Sr. said in her mind. Let's pose a hypothetical. Say you were born to Gims and grew up in a tiny house and never had um potten to piss in. Mightn't you have turned out a strange lost gal with 12 or so marriages behind you and a tragic runaway daughter? No, she answered, I wouldn't have. You know that for a certainty, Paul said. Well, maybe I'm just dull. Perhaps I failed to grasp your immensely higher logic. Maybe having lived a perfect life, you got all the answers. Don't. Do not. Do not defend that one there. I merely posed the query, he said. He was bearing down on her in that way of his, not even giving the other person a chance to. Long or white snook, he said. Clock's ticking. Answer, please. Now, how should she know who she'd be if she weren't her? Why would you even want to know that? It didn't amount to anything. Ma, you want to go over and say hi? Pammy said. She's an old friend, right? Well, she's old, Alma said, but she's no friend of mine. Ma, God, Pammy said. We never had nothing to do with her, Alma said. Big hippie. Never meant nothing to us. Not much. Not much she hadn't. Zowie, here came Alma Carson, up Pine Street, daughter in tow, Pammy or Kimmy or whoever. She'd seen the son, Polly, at Wegman yesterday, arms full of flowers, for Alma. Not sure how that worked. Mean old thing, Alma, gets Mother Day flowers. Nice, generous mom, her, Debbie, gets... Lord, what a face. 
shriveled apple, drawstring purse pulled tight. When was God or whoever going to lower the boom <laughs> on a meanie like that? Or did she just get to live out her life? The mean it's all get out. Oh, God, schma, she, Debbie, wasn't a big believer in God or hell or any of that male-based crap. <laughs> She'd been no angel herself, having done, yes, a few drugs in her day, and also she didn't exactly love the idea of showing up at the pearly gates or whatnot and having saint whoever look her up in his book and go, whoa, hey, I was just sitting here tabulating the number of guys you had in your life, and yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you wait here a second while I go check with God on what the limit is? <laughs> sweep, sweep. Why did we use that word when the actual sound was more like sweep? Sweep, sweep. Because, okay, yes, she loved men. And they loved her back in the day. For her, it was a form of joyous overflow. Like that art guy on TV who loved to paint so much that sometimes his wife got peeved and he'd go holding off his brush, joyous overflow, Ruthie, mea culpa. <laughs> She'd been like that. But with sleeping with guys. <laughs> She enjoyed every last one of them, even the sleezes, especially the sleezes. That salesman from Ohio with his little blindfolds? What had that been about? Did he carry them everywhere? Apparently. But God bless him, that was just him. That was his thing. Everyone had a thing or several things. And her view was, if you love the universe, which she did, or I'd like to think she did, or anyway, she tried to, you had to love all of it. Even Mr. Ohio, Tom, Tim, with his little blindfold case. Where was he now? He'd been like 15 years older than her, so he'd be, what, in a home? Dead? Having his own interesting conversation with Saint whoever? Read the blindfolds? Read the not exactly stopping when she... But even that, you learn something from everything. Or at least she did. What she learned from Mr. Ohio was, well, she wasn't sure. Don't date guys from Ohio. <laughs> ha, what a, what a hoot. Swept. Tim and Tom from Ohio have been followed by who, whom. Carl, then Tobin, then the Lawrence Gary combo. <laughs> After that, it got blurry. Lord, what a roster. She really lived. But not discriminated between tall, short, nerdy, cool, married, not married, whatever. No blockages, no hang-ups. If you're interested in me, I thank you for that. I bow to that part of you that bows to me, let's get it on. <laughs> no, really. She recanted exactly none of it. Why recant openness to the moment? Bring it. Even now, bring it. Open, open, open. She ought to run across pine and give Alma a hug. That would freak the old bitch out. <laughs> but no. If she learned anything in her life, it was you had to accept people the way they were. Like Vicky, her daughter. Whoever Vicky had been at any, any given moment, she, Debbie, had accepted it. When Vicky wanted to be a bookworm and wear those big cloudy boots and memorize everything about the French Revolution and always be tidying up the house and scrubbing the toilets and whatnot, she'd been like, go for it, kiddo, I accept you. <laughs> when Vicky wanted to mow the lawn because the parade was this weekend and the whole town would see how long their grass was, as if that were a thing, have at it, amiga. Even though you're only like eight, reach way up and dig in with your cloudy boots and push that big heavy mower. I won't be embarrassed about it at all. Whatever Vicky wanted to be, that had been fine with her. Only wouldn't it have been cool if what Vicky had wanted to be was a less subservient, more out there type of girl, so self-assured that nothing ever threw her. Somehow she got stuck with the wrong kid, which made for some tension. Vicky was so uptight. Everything had to be perfect. Like once Vicky brought over this nice young guy, Rob, and she, Debbie, made them mac and cheese. But there was no milk. As she'd been getting the runaround from Phil, or maybe it was Dennis, and was a little distracted and hadn't been to the store in a week or two, so she made it with strawberry yogurt. <laughs> and the kids declined to eat it. And she pointed out, just being honest, that they must be a couple of pretty privileged humans if they were turning up their nose at what would pass in 90% of the world for a fucking feast, <laughs> and if the F word, Rob, the son of surgeons, had blanched or blushed or whatever, basically looked like he was about to throw up or fall over from shock. <laughs> and Vicky had started stuttering. And all that time, Vicky, she remembered this in particular, this detail being so classically Vicky, big self-sabotager, had kept her retainer on 
like a harmonica holder. <laughs> With a boy over. What was that about? So yeah, tense, tense between them, tenser and tenser. Finally, senior year, Vicky had pulled this really skillful tension release move of bolting, running off. With that little punk Al Fowler and his string bean cousin. Al came back a few months later, said they'd left her in Phoenix. She was being a total bitch. Two weeks after that, a postcard. Ma, I'm fine. Don't try find me. And that was that. 32 years ago. Not a word since. Swept. It was what it was. But you know what? Actually, she felt good about it. She did. She, she raised an independent young woman. Young woman so intent on getting what she needed, she hadn't even bothered to say goodbye to her own mother. That was bold. That was awesome. She'd raise a warrior princess. Because if Vicky had said goodbye, Debbie would have tried to talk her out of it. She loved that kid so much. She would have said, like, okay, look, agreed. I'm a mess. There are too many men in my life. I'm not always available to help you with whatever, whatever algebra or whatnot. But give me another chance and I'll be more focused on you and your needs and will totally disavow who I am. <laughs> the person always trying to say yes to life. And will do my best, hereby resolve, to start saying no to life and very fakely pouring myself into that constricting mold you seem to prefer me in, perfect robotic mother, so that nothing I do will ever challenge you in the least or make you step even an inch outside your tiny restricted comfort zone. Emma was po posed now across the street, glaring at her as if stuck. What's up, kid? What do you want? A bow? A salute? A wave? Here you go, pal. Care to wave back, Your Majesty? No? Fine. Far be it from her to judge anyone at any time. To judge was to dominate, to place yourself above another, which she refused to do. Some would. Many did, not her. Although, wouldn't it be a hoot when Alma kicked the bucket? <laughs> and Saint whoever was like, why so mean? <laughs> why so proud? Why such a hypocrite? <laughs> did you not find life beautiful? Where was your heart? Why did you squander your precious life force trying to possess, control, interfere? And Alma, newly dead, would stand there stunned like, I'm having a realization right now. Who is correct? Debbie. <laughs> Who is wrong? Me. Alma. Then they'd show the movie of her life and Alma would see what a fuckhound Paul had been and that would really drive it all home. Would she, Debbie, be standing nearby inside heaven looking on amused? No, because she was going to outlive Alma. Ah, no, let's say she was dead. She'd be like, I knew you in life, Alma. Do you remember me? <laughs> Gosh, Debbie, hi, I do. <laughs> Alma would say, and I'm so sorry. I was always a super snoot to you. <laughs> yes, you were, she'd say, but I forgive you. <laughs> and saying whoever would look over all impressed like, wow. <laughs> Even though she always treated you like crap, you're being totally cool to her right now. <laughs> but then again, you fucked my husband. <laughs> Alma would say, like a gazillion times, according to that movie I just now watched. <laughs> Even when I was in the hospital having Pammy, does that come as a surprise to you? Saint whoever would say, about your husband? It does, yes, Alma would say. I live in a state of self-imposed blindness, never seeking truth. <laughs> That's too bad, Saint whoever would say. That's some bad juju right there. <laughs> What is the greater sin, do you think? Adultery or standing in the way of true love? I don't know, Emma would say. Standing in the way of true love, St. Weber would say. But he was my husband, Emma would say. Well, marriage is just a shallow cultural tradition, St. Weber would say. At least it is to us up here. She fucked him and fucked him, Emma would say, off crestfallen, right under my nose, and I never knew. <coughs> And yet here I am in heaven, Debbie would say. Think about it. <laughs>